Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schmidt List Live. I'm your host, Kurt Schmidt, president and partner at Foundry, and I am excited today because I've got a good old friend of mine, John Standish, joining me. We're going to talk about all things about startups scaling up your startup, scaling up your scale up all the the, the ups. We're going to talk a lot about ups. And speaking of ups, I should mention that uh, well, we are hiring at Foundry Makes. Uh, and if you or someone you know have some interest, check out foundrymakes.com slash careers. We're always looking for talented people. There's some new job postings going up this week, so make sure you keep an eye on those pages. Uh, and I'll be talking more about it later. But in the meantime, I want to introduce Mr. Standish. John, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing well. Good. Glad to be good on the to show, see you. Kurt. Ah, it's good to you see too. you. Thanks for joining me. So tell me about Artisan Venture Labs. You are there now and uh, tell me about the work you're doing there. What do you do there? Uh, what do you folks do there? Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I'm the chief strategy officer for Artisan Venture Lab. We're a technology and investment firm headquartered in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but also have a satellite office in San Diego, California, which is where I am currently. And I kind of bounce back and forth between offices, but um, happy to be out here in sunny San Diego. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yep. and, yeah, oh, it's it's a uh, it's nice having the two locations. Though the last time I was back in Minnesota visiting, it was a hundred degrees every single day. I know. Um, yeah, oppressively hot. <laughs> it's not been awesome. Yeah, um, but you know, uh, our firm we specialize in full cycle e commerce, software design and development, uh, cross platform marketing, and we also have uh, a slew of other services. Everything from um, business consulting to if you have questions about like business tax or legal consultation, we provide those services as well. That's very but, cool. So you, you in your career, yeah, much like me, you've been in part of the agency world for a very long time. <clears throat> and you've worked with a lot of startups in your career as well. Uh, you know, one thing that I get asked a lot, John, is when people have a, a startup that maybe is starting to gain some traction and it's starting to move quickly, you know, uh, <laughs> you have to wear a lot of hats in those early days, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what? Do you, what's some of your advice that you usually give those people? Where should they be paying attention to? Should it be the sales and hiring? Should it be the, the office space? <laughs> should it be the marketing? Um, you know, I, I get so many people asking questions because they're wearing so many different hats uh, as the business is growing. They're, they're not quite sure where to put their attention. Yeah, I mean, I think foundationally having a sound business plan and kind mm -hmm. of really identifying your your target audience, the demographic that you're serving. Uh, if you have that really locked down and that's something that you're referencing when you go through all the other work that needs to happen with a in a startup environment, then it's kind of like your North Star, your guiding light. Um, so really fleshing out your business plan and your audience is key. What are your business objectives? And then everything that you build on top of that are serving those objectives. Whether that comes to like the platforms that you choose or the channels that you invest in to promote, um, they're all gonna be guiding those foundational uh, objectives that you defined early on. Yeah, I think that's the, the thing where I've seen in a number of these that they their original business goals change. Maybe they had a platform that was geared towards salespeople, but all of a sudden recruiters are finding it really valuable and they have to make a kind of a decision, right? Where do I stick to my core, what I was going after, or do I jump on this new opportunity where I see that this whole new group is taking uh, you know, a liking to it. I'm seeing a lot of growth in that area. What would be your suggestion, John? Should I split into two businesses? Should I move the whole business in <laughs> one direction? You know, what have you seen work and what 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 uh, what uh, what doesn't work? I've seen it go both ways where it's been like, okay, other opportunities have developed and maybe it makes sense to separate into two different businesses or uh, maybe you revisit your original business objectives on a regular basis to see if they still make sense because they might change. And there's just so many different ways to approach 
just being adaptable and trying to figure out how you can be quick to market, but also deliver like a quality product. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's iterative and you're always tweaking. It's the work's never done. And <laughs> no, you know, it's, it's always experimenting done. and then course correcting. And that's, but that's like with a startup or an established business, you're always doing that. You're testing yeah. and you're making corrections and you're adapting constantly. And what do you find in the e-commerce space specifically? Because you had mentioned uh, AVL's working a lot in the e-commerce space. Is it is it people transitioning their businesses online? Is it people that are expanding their businesses online? Because I think in the early days of retail, people were a little shocked that, wait a second, I've got a store that's open 24 hours a day now <laughs> um, yeah. versus what I was used to. Where are you seeing those opportunities? I, I see it uh, in both ways. There are like okay. established clients that we work with that already have like partnerships with apparel companies or um, other product manufacturers and they're releasing new inventory. They're doing like, um, you know, special release collections and things like that, uh, that are like limited numbers and either they're scaling up or we're also working with, uh, like people that are just starting out, maybe they have like a small Etsy shop or they are just fulfilling orders through Instagram direct messages. Um, you know, there's a couple of different scenarios that play out, but we really recommend trying to pick a platform that you can scale with that like foundationally will support your business as it grows. So we use Shopify a lot. Um, we find that that platform to be versatile. It, works really well for the the scale of clients that we have and okay they have plenty more of room to grow on that platform for everyone that we're working with currently so uh we kind of specialize in shopify and we'll uh guide people through that process and what you know subscription plan might make the most sense for them what tooling that they could use to, to orchestrate the right customer experience uh so that they can grow and then it's also you know, when you get into selling products online, there's so many considerations that our clients need help with that you yeah. just don't think about. And there's there's platforms like, you know, Squarespace and Wix that have e-commerce solutions built in, and yep. they do make it sound super simple. And then it might give you like a um, a false sense of confidence <laughs> when you when you go in to yeah. start connecting all the dots, and you realize, oh, there's so many things I need to take into consideration when selling products or services online. Well, especially if you're, I mean, if you're selling what a lot of people are selling, those things seem pretty straightforward, right? But if yours has any customization, if there's any, you know, uh, if you have to customize it at all. So let's talk about, um, uh, you know, these larger solutions like big commerce and things like that. When, when, you know, when should I be, you know, Shopify is an amazing platform. It has a lot of expandability, but when should people be looking at, these more larger custom solutions uh, that uh, that seem to be pretty popular as well. Yeah, I guess it really just depends on the volume that you're doing and okay. like what your inventory situation is. If it's, you know, I'm assuming that it's more product based and you probably have like a warehousing solution and you have a certain amount of inventory that you um, have on hand and maybe it's like distribution hubs across the country. Uh, when you get to that point where there's so many different moving parts, then it makes sense to assess your business and all those different yeah. moving parts to see if a custom solution is necessary. Um, you know, personally with all the e-commerce work that we're doing at Artisan Venture Lab, it's more like mid-sized businesses. So sure. um, we're not scaling to that, you know, like big global network of, <laughs> of e-commerce, but, um, yep. Well, what about, you know. uh, what about these, these mid-sized businesses? Because, uh, Foundry, our company works with mid-sized companies as well. And a lot of the questions that come from those CEOs is, well, when should I hire a team or when should I build a development team to maintain these sites? I mean, is there a tipping point that you find John where it makes, you know, where it makes sense to use agencies like ours, for this sort of outside help versus starting to build that inside team or uh, what have you found in the year? When, when have you, when is the tipping point in your mind? 
Well, in my experience, typically we'll help our clients like get everything set up from the very beginning. And, and some people are further along the path than others. So for instance, it might be a situation where uh, a client is still like even trying to establish their brand and they're not ready to have a digital presence because they don't have that whole situation figured out. So like having a strong, concise and consistent brand and voice that you can lead with and then sourcing assets and making sure that those assets are of quality and that they can instill yeah. consumer confidence, you know, just starting from this, the, all these foundational elements and then building upon it, uh, setting up shop, Shopify stores for mid-sized businesses. You know, there's so many things you have to consider with products and variances and tax, um, and shipping rules and all of these mm -hmm. pieces. So we like to help our clients navigate that and piece all of those portions together. So you have a workflow that works and it's sustainable. Um, and then we'll often go through an exercise of training, whether it's an intern or an internal staff. I mean, a lot of these businesses are smaller to midsize, so they don't have a big internal team. But I would say like, if you get to a point where you're doing enough sales that you can sustain bringing on staff, training on um, someone to manage a Shopify store is fairly straightforward as far as like staffing up for custom development that's really on a case by case basis i haven't really been in a situation recently where like heavy custom development has been needed for any of the okay. storefronts that we've been putting together yeah and it, do, you, do you find because of that's uh, kind of just user experience like user patterns people are used to a certain experience and so you know why try anything fancy you know is it is, it, is that where it comes from well, there's certainly a like why reinvent the wheel type of thing. We've right. kind of found that, you know, so many uh, online vendors are using Shopify. Like I can spot a Shopify store in instantly. You know, there's yeah. design patterns that are familiar and it's like, okay, they're on Shopify. I don't even have to look at the source code to know that that's <laughs> the case. Yeah. Um, but for a lot of the small to mid-sized companies, we would recommend investing more in the marketing of your product and your business rather than custom software development at that stage of the game. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like that you're going to get as much return on your investment. So right. uh, if, if there's limited budget, I'd recommend going with like a stock Shopify theme. Maybe there's some plugins that you might subscribe to, to give you some enhanced features here and there, but then mostly taking the rest of whatever you're able to budget and figuring out a monthly marketing calendar, what social media channels that you want to promote through. Um, if there's any sort of like partnerships or an inf influencers that you can work yep. with to amplify your voice and drive more traffic to that site to start, you know, making sales and generating revenue so that you can yep. get a nice, awesome custom solution. If that makes sense in the future. Yeah. And that's what I found, you know, speaking of that, that scaling portion of it is that, you, you know, if you're focused on continuing to grow in terms of growing traffic and growing those, you know, those, those other things will sort themselves out a bit over, over time, back to your point about making sure that, uh, you know, if, you know, it's garbage in garbage out, right? If you're, if you're not focused on bringing in uh, better, better clientele, more high paying clientele, uh, people that are more loyal, building advocacy with those groups. And you're mm -hmm. more focused on, you know, should we build a custom API? Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> doesn't really make a lot of sense, does it? No, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of times we'll, we'll promote kind of a uh, low or no code solutions so that our clients can really discover what works best for them and what features and functionality they really need versus what they think they need, uh, you know, without collecting data to inform those decisions, you could be spending money on things you don't really need. So, yep. uh, we like to, we say walk, crawl, run, start with like an MVP solution, minimum viable product and, uh, keep building on it over time. Well, I think patience is is the key too, because back to your point about, I mean, I'll hear people talk about, yeah, we need to walk call call run while they're running, 
Um, <laughs> yes. You know, and, and not just running, but they'll be doing hurdles and, you know, maybe even have like a, you know, a long jump like coming up, you know, and because again, it's like you, you want to, you know, as they say, strike while the iron is hot, right? You don't want to lose momentum. And that's where I find in those, those startups that are starting to build up quickly is, is that, you know, you have to go through this hiring burst, right? So you've got to get mm-hmm. people in all these different roles and, and quickly, and where I've seen some of the, uh, you know, the, the founders struggle is that they used to do those three people's jobs <laughs> and, yeah. and now they have to let go. You know, do you find, I mean, I mean, again, whether it's the startup space or the e-commerce space, do you find it hard as these people make these transitions towards these digital solutions that they're letting go of maybe their traditional ways and what sort of advice do you give them? Yeah, that's, that's hard, right? Especially <laughs> it when it's, it's like your baby, you're so attached to it. Yeah. I, I'm having separation anxiety. I can't let go. Uh, but, you know, that's not sustainable. You have to be able to let go of the reins and trust other people to help and people that are more in the know than yourself. So personally, I've interviewed n- a number of candidates o- across m- several roles uh, yep. over the years, but I kind of find that experience doesn't necessarily equal uh, apprehension, drive, or attitude. Mm-hmm. And those traits, in my experience, they are more powerful than yeah. just the experience on your resume. And then trust and autonomy is really important. And like just setting up uh, a culture of shared success and growth opportunities so that your employees are happy. They feel like you trust them to do what they were hired on to do. And when I'm interviewing, I'm, I'm also like really, I pay close attention to the questions that candidates ask, you know, if they're inquisitive and they Mm -hmm. want to learn things outside their comfort zone. Um, if they have, if they're like always seeking and and looking for what like the next thing is, those are good qualities to have. And especially if you're a startup and you have to be selective about who you hire because, you know, a hire could make or break you. Um, Yes. It's a, it's a tricky situation, but when you get, when you do get the right people, it, it feels amazing. It does. And to your point, uh, what I love about hiring people for, and like you had mentioned, kind of towards for trajectory other than just experience, right? Kind of where they're, where I can see them, them going. And part of that is a, uh, a contract that you're doing because 50% of that trajectory is going to be on how you actually manage that person, how the time you put in to that person as well. Because I, I see people saying, well, you know, maybe this person doesn't have quite enough experience, but then I'll also challenge and say, you know, well, but what if you had a bit more time to spend with them? Mm-hmm. You know, could they get there quickly? Back to your point about enthusiasm, right? Um, being Just being excited uh, and, and curious, right? Because I've found that people that are a bit more novice actually help organizations grow. And here's why. The reason I've found is because they ask great questions that sometimes we have taken for granted as founders or owners for so long. They'll ask questions like, why are we, why do we do it this way? And be like, um, I don't, I, we just always done that. Do we have to do it that way? Well, I don't think so. What, what, what way should you know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, I find that in that scaling up piece is that, um, you don't have to hire somebody with, you know, 200 years experience in this, in this role, as long as you know, like you had mentioned, John, that they're going to ask a lot of questions. They're going to, and not in a, not necessarily an adversarial or, you know, challenging you sort of way, but maybe um, having you double check, like, did I actually cross all the T's and dot all the I's or am right, I just right. doing that as I go along? Right. Well, and just the personality types that can be, you know, somewhat comfortable with ambiguity. Yeah. That's really helpful when you're yeah. like a small scrappy startup and you're trying to figure it out. And it's like, everybody's trying to figure this out and we're going to do it together <laughs> and it'll be fine. So, yep. um, you know, as long as we tackle everything as a team, 
no one will get left behind. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, you got to create a safe space, right, where people can feel like they can make mistakes or they can ask those questions, uh, you know, and uh, a lot of people are looking for cues from the leadership or people, you know, and a fast growing company, sometimes, you know, that person who was new two weeks ago is now like a senior crusty. Oh, absolutely. Person, right. Um, I had a colleague not long ago who switched careers and just went to like a boot camp type of situation. And she started and she learned so fast. It's like, yeah, it's just like you mentioned, it was incredible how yeah. quickly she progressed and she just super driven. Um, like you didn't even have to ask. It was kind of like you could give her a, a challenge and she would figure it out and then some. And it's like, OK, this is the type of employee that I would love to have every time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, uh, you know, it's it's making sure that, um, you know, and people always ask, like, how do you how do you find those people? And, you know, yeah, we, we, uh, as you saw at the beginning of the show, we definitely promote that we're, we're hiring, but a lot of it mm -hmm. is networking and letting people know this is what we're looking for. This is the type of place we are, which is just as important as saying who you're looking for. I think making sure it's a match for that person to say like, yeah, that's someplace I want to spend time, you know? Right. Right. No, absolutely. Um, I've had experiences too, where I've had friends or former colleagues uh, come up and ask me about, you know, what we're working on and if we're in a position that we're going to be hiring for more right. staff as well. And it's like some of the people that I speak with are, I, I often wonder if they would be happy with our organization because maybe what they specialize in isn't exactly in our wheelhouse and trying to get them to morph into the services that we provide might not be the right fit. So, you know, even it's just the, the balance between like, there might be a new talent that's like new to the industry that's hungry and ready to grow, or there's someone that's really established and super pro at what they do, but trying to make those connections and make sure that they fit. So everyone's happy. Yeah. Well, and again, you know, you, you want to make sure that, you know, again, I always push back on the people that are like, well, I need somebody with this much experience or that much experience. You know, I think a lot of it goes back to that founder is like, how much time are you going to spend with them to make sure they understand the vision? They understand what success looks like, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and is this a person who can achieve success? And you mentioned this at the early on, John, is that if you've got strong foundations, and you can explain those foundations, why they exist, and 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 you spend the time with helping coach people to get there. Um, you know, I feel like you can take more of a risk, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, instead of just saying like, oh, well, this person's worked in our exact industry, in the exact role we're hiring, and the exact, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've I've grown more comfortable over the years with taking risk when I feel good about a candidate who just seems uh, intuitive and hungry right. and, you know, is up for the challenge. So uh, I've, got, I've got a comment from Paula here asking if we have a checklist of what we've seen uh, uh, successful startups do or the opposite of typical ones, <laughs> typical mistakes that people have made. Um, <clears throat> well, we talked a little bit about the mistakes. I mean, I think one of the mistakes is making sure that you're keeping the gas on the pedal when it comes to acquiring new customers, you know, because, mm -hmm. um, but I think the mistake that I've seen a lot of people make is, is in retention, uh, is that they will continually pump, uh, you know, gas into the sales team, but maybe not into the customer success team. How about you, John? Yeah. You know, I, I don't really have a good example to to hinge off of that right now because for the most part the clients that we were working with are very sales driven. Yeah. And so we don't partner with their internal teams that often. Sure. To to really like have that that connective that connection with them or provide organizational consultation on mm -hmm. their HR practices or whatnot. Yeah. Um but 
it's just all, all about balancing act, right? Of it keeping is. keeping the right momentum with your company, making sure that you're uh, doing the right things to keep your workforce happy and engaged and also driven and curious. Right. But yeah, well, that's because that's what I go back to the, what I've seen in so many of these organizations is that they're not necessarily super surprised when they land that next big deal, but they're really surprised when that big client leaves all of a sudden, uh, they're like, where'd that come from? You know, and it's something that's probably been festering for a long time. But again, it goes back to making sure that, you know, while the exciting stuff is gathering all the new things and bringing in all the new things, making sure that you've got a real focus on, uh, customer, you know, customer success, you know, people that are in, uh, your system, people that are using your products or buying your products, um, that they are feeling set up for success. That's a, that's a place where I've seen people just too often take, uh, for granted, right. Is that we've, you know, it's like Pokemon, right? Like got to catch them all. And then I guess we just put them in a box and don't feed them. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. Right. Well, I've certainly seen the situation where, uh, all the eggs are in one basket. Yes. And that, yeah. that can be an exciting and horrifying place to be. So you land <laughs> yeah, your big client, right. your big sale, and you're like, yes, now we're, we've just like gone up a level, Yep. but now how do we adapt? And also not to like put all of your resources into that one basket because you still need to be out like looking for yes diversification and not getting yep. all caught up, you know, the forest from the trees situation. Yeah. No, that's a great point, too, is that that, uh, you know, to Paula's question, you know, I think both uh, opportunity and problem is, you know, customer retention. But, uh, you know, um, yeah, if all of a sudden you find that you've got one client or one group that's like 70 percent of your your business, um, you better start digging yourself out of that really quickly. While it may seem nice because it's like, oh, this is just something I can count on. Uh, for right. a long time, you've got to diversify very quickly because uh, unless it's the U.S. government, <laughs> I wouldn't want somebody to be 80 percent of my business. No, no, definitely. No. Uh, what other what other, uh, you know, have you seen successful startups to John? Like what are some things that you've experienced in your career where people have made the right decision? Uh, is it is it? You know, in the, in the, it could be anywhere in the development side, the sales side, the marketing side, the operational side. Um, where have you seen some real shining examples? So I feel like, um, you know, we, we work with a lot of products, you know, brands yeah. and, and like currently a lot of just like a, a different apparel brands and things like that. So yeah, let's just say products, uh, right? Let's say, yeah, let's say an apparel brand, for example, you could go to market with, like some boxy Gildan terrible t-shirt with a bad design and you have no product. So it's like, okay, your, your dream dreams of having a t-shirt empire are not going to go far. But if you have like a nice product, nice material, and you invest in a good product and that's like foundational, then you have something to promote and something that people want. But then successful startups that really, pay close attention to largely like social media marketing and um, strategic partnerships with influencers. Yeah. That's when things catch on super fast. So sure. uh, I feel like really paying attention to your marketing calendar and how you're going to promote your good quality product uh, is key. It's, it's one of the most important things. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, again, we can lose sight of things very, very quickly. I think one of the, you know, to that point, I think one of the things that I see people make mistakes is that they're gathering a lot of data, but they don't really use it to make decisions. I think that's a oh, yeah, something yeah. I've seen a lot of startups do where they make mistakes is that, yes, they're, they're so concerned about tracking all the things, they're doing all that stuff, but they're basically just kind of looking at vanity metrics. They're looking at the amount sold and they're, or they're looking at the amount of views or right. those types of things, but they're not looking at things like time of day and conversion. Like they're not digging yeah. down into the analytics. Is that something you've seen as well, John? Yep, absolutely. So like not paying attention to your cost per lead or cost per sale mm. um, and how that impacts. And you know, there are so many 
awesome analytics tools and there's so much information available Tons. to make these decisions. So it's, yeah, that is super important. I actually had jotted down a couple things around that too. Yeah. Uh, and I lost where it is. It'll come <laughs> back to me. <clears throat> but yeah, the, um, the idea of using, um, is that the, again, like I said, there's so we constantly run in organizations that gather tons of data because they've got, you got free tools, like Google, there's mm -hmm. tons of free analytics tools out there. Uh, you know, you got Facebook pixels, you've got all these different things that will gather tons of information, but sitting down and thinking strategically through those things is, uh, well, that's work, man. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. But if you're able to um, use those tools to track your engagement and, de and determine how that impacts your marketing ROI, yeah. That's really important. And then it's going to give you a better view of how healthy your company is. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's critical. But it's it it's is. also a full time job. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. Well, again, going back to that wearing all the different hats, right? Is that you've got, mm -hmm. you've yet, you know, you eventually you've got to get somebody in there that can actually go through that information because they're going to find opportunities. You know, and and again, I think there's two sides of it, right? Is that you've got the the types of founders that are very engaged and they're like, well, this customer told me once that they didn't like this thing. So we're never doing that thing. And it's like, well, but if we look at the data, 90 percent of everybody else really likes it. So, you know, you can yeah. you, this anecdotal information that can crush a company is really huge right well back in my day when we started this you know blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> yeah absolutely well i think um one definite advantage to working in technology now is that not only are there so many tools to um, give you really granular data around your business but i feel like people are more receptive to that those yeah. data sources than they used to be and yeah. so it helps kind of remove subjectivity from a number of things, even from design, um, you could be like, well, there's a lot of evidence that states that you should use at least this font size or this contrast so that mm -hmm. things are accessible. Um, and then it, it helps, it shortens conversations for sure. Um, but also using data to inform like the language that you use, um, doing like AB, running AB tests to figure out what type of imagery or uh, vocabulary perform better than others. Yeah. All of those types of things really help steer a conversation and removes the subjectivity because it's like the numbers don't lie. Yeah, uh, no, and I love that you brought up accessibility because I would say that's another area that people um, fall flat on very, very quickly is not following accessibility standards because mm -hmm. you can ostracize a, an entire group of uh, folks just because you didn't allow for them to enlarge the font size if they need to or different yep. types of things. Right. And, um, and in some cases you can open yourself up to legal, uh, issues as well that, that you weren't expecting. So, uh, you know, and accessibility, you know, there's a lot of great information out there. So yeah, you can go out and hire accessible 360 and number of companies to help you, uh, when you need a more Herculean effort, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things out there, uh, a lot of information that people can learn. Uh, you don't have to be a developer or designer, right? No, there's, there's great resources. There's, um, like browser extensions that'll help flag kind of high level accessibility issues. Cause in my experience so much, uh, of the problems that we find with accessible websites is really in the, the content management. So the content hierarchy and getting pinged for these things, how images are tagged oh, and sure. a, a number of other, you know, content management related items. So training the content managers to follow best practices is really critical. And there are checklists that help because a lot of it's not that difficult. It's just being mindful. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, John. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I always enjoy our conversations. So if I want to know more about Artisan Venture Labs and the work that you do there, where's a good place to go? How do I get in contact with you, John, so you can come and fix all my problems? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So artisanvl.com is our website. Uh, you can reach out to us there for 
um, general inquiries or uh, funding inquiries as well. And we're also active on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. So yeah, Artisan Venture Lab. That's cool. Yeah, I'm excited for you. This is a, this is an exciting venture that you're, for lack, no pun intended. Uh, we're laughing. <laughs> I think it's an awesome venture. Absolutely. Well, thanks again, John. Yeah. I appreciate you joining me today. Yeah, it was great chatting with you, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, everyone. That was John. Check out artisanvl.com. They're awesome. Um, I love everybody over there. They're fantastic individuals. Speaking of fantastic individuals, check out foundrymakes.com slash careers. Yes. Yes. And tell a friend or two. You know what? While you're at it, maybe tell like a half a dozen. Let people know. Come and check out what the work we're doing. I appreciate you taking time out of your day. We will see you next time.